All right. Okay. So um, welcome everybody. Uh, we're very happy to have Isabel uh, from KITP here to talk to us about uh, P not PQ. So we will find out what that means. So, uh, okay, Isabel. Okay. So thank you for the invitation. And as my title suggests, I'll be talking about parity solutions to the strong CP problem. So my talk is going to be largely based on this recent paper that I wrote with my collaborators at UCSB. I will start with a brief introduction about the strong CP problem and motivation for why to consider solutions to a strong CP that are different from the QCD axiom. I will then discuss in detail the structure of parity solutions. So these were first proposed by Kaladi Babu and Ravindra Moapatra in these two papers, and then also uh, shortly after by, by Barr and collaborators. So I want to emphasize that these are different from the so-called Nelson Barr models uh, that are based on restoring CP. I will not be talking about those, about those today. Then I will spend uh, most of the time discussing the phenomenology of these models, including collider and flavor signatures, implications for EDM experiments, as well as gravitational waves. There has been criticism of these parity solutions in the past, namely by these three authors, Alve, Dine, and Draper. <clears throat> and I'll try to bring up and address uh, their criticism as we, as we go along. So let me start with a, a very brief introduction of what the strong CP problem is and apologies to those of you who already know this very well. So as you engage theorists in general have a discrete set of classical minima that are degenerate. These minima correspond to field configurations that are pure gauge. So they are all degenerate with zero energy but nevertheless they have a non-trivial topology. And in particular, it is possible to classify them in topologically distinct classes. And this classification can be done in terms of a single integer, which we call winding number. So classically, you could choose any one of these vacua with a given winding number and expand around the vacuum. However, quantum mechanically, there is tunneling between topologically distinct sectors. And as usual in a semi-classical expansion, this tunneling is described by the existence of instantons. So appropriately normalize uh, the action of young male instantons is given by an integer, which is the topological charge of the instanton. So instantons with topological charge, say Q, describe tunneling between vacua whose winding numbers differ by Q units. So the true vacuum of the theory is not a vacuum with a given winding number. Instead, it must include a linear combination of all of those vacua. In defining this linear combination, there is a phase ambiguity that is captured by a single angular parameter, theta, and in principle, theta can take any value from zero to two pi. And for obvious reasons, this, uh, this angular parameter is called the young males vacuum angle. So the value of theta enters the theory as a boundary condition that we need to impose in order to properly characterize the vacuum. Physical quantities uh, will then depend on theta. In particular, uh, the vacuum energy density uh, now depends, depends on theta. And of course, as you all know, uh, in the Lagrangian formulation of an SU engage theory, this angle appears as the coefficient of this topological operator, which also makes it obvious that any value of theta that is neither zero nor pi will violate both parity and CP. In more general uh, non-abelian theories that contain charged matter, the physical significance of this vacuum angle crucially depends on the spectrum of charged fermions. So in the standard model, there is a single vacuum angle that is physical, um, sorry about that, which is the vacuum angle of, of QCD. And for historical reasons, uh, it typically goes, goes by the name of, of theta bar. So as I said earlier, theta bar provides a physical measurement of both parity and CP violation in the strong sector of the standard model. The most useful quantity in terms of probing the value of the QCD vacuum angle experimentally is the electric dipole moment of the neutron. So the theoretical prediction for the neutron EDM is proportional to theta bar. 
experimentally, we have not observed a neutron EDM. All we have currently is this upper bound, which in turn constrains the value of, of theta bar to be smaller than around 10 to the minus 10. So the QCD vacuum angle needs to be incredibly small. And this is a problem or a puzzle for the following reasons. So in the standard model, the QCD vacuum angle receives contributions from two different sources. On the one hand, from the coefficient of the topological operator involving the QCD field strengths. And on the other hand, from the argument of the determinant of the quark mass matrix. Now we know in particular that the quark mass matrix has to be complex and we know that because it is a requirement for there to be CP violation in the electroweak sector of the standard model. And we've known for a long time that indeed the phase in the CKA matrix is not only non-zero, but actually um, or the one. In fact, it is both CP and also parity that are maximally violated by the electroweak interactions. And this brings us to the essence of the strong CP problem, which is that it is not possible to understand the smallness of the QCD vacuum angle based on the underlying symmetries of the standard model. Instead, if we want to explain why theta bar is so small, we need either a dynamical mechanism or some additional symmetry structure beyond what we have in the standard model. So traditionally, the most popular mechanism to solve the strong CP problem has been the so-called QCD axiom. In this context, theta bar is not just a parameter. Instead, it gets promoted to the status of a dynamical field, the axion, which is a pseudonambu goldstone of a spontaneously broken uh, U1 global symmetry that we call U1PQ for p queen And that crucially must also be broken explicitly by QCD. So being a pseudoscalar, the axion can couple to the QCD field strength in this way. In turn, QCD dynamics generate a potential for the axion that is periodic and has a minimum at a value of the axion vacuum expectation value such that the effective QCD vacuum angle completely vanishes, therefore solving the strong CP problem. So on the face of it, this is a very minimal and elegant solution to the strong CP problem and a huge amount of experimental effort, as you know, has gone into, into probing this axiom paradigm. However, it has one important flaw, which is that in order to really work, this mechanism must be such that the breaking of the U1PQ symmetry by QCD and therefore the generated action potential must dominate the one part in 10 to the 10 over any other contribution coming from additional degrees of freedom. So new dynamics are responsible for say solving the hierarchy problem or doing biogenesis or dark matter they cannot contribute significantly to the, to the action potential. And this is particularly problematic since, as you all know, we expect that all global symmetries will be, will be violated in any gravitational UV completion. So the violation of the U1PQ symmetry by gravity will generate a potential for the axiom that in turn will move the theory away from the vacuum of, of vanishing theta bar. So for example, if we consider the leading higher dimensional operator that violates the PQ symmetry, so phi here is the Petsy queen field, the phase of which is again the axiom, then in order for this not to spoil the solution to the strong CP problem, the coefficient of this operator needs to be incredibly, incredibly small. So we say that the PQ symmetry needs to be a very high quality global symmetry, which is in tension with the breaking of global symmetries that we expect in the context of quantum gravity. And this goes by the, by the name of the, the action quality problem. It is not impossible to solve the action quality problem and arrange for the U1PQ symmetry to be an accidental, very high quality global symmetry. But these efforts um, certainly come at the expense of, of minimality, which is often advertised as one of the most attractive features of the QCD axiom. More to the point, um, arranging for the U1PQ to remain a very approximate global symmetry in the context of a gravitational UV completion, such as a string theory, while it is possible, it puts important constraints on, on a string theory model building that lead to the soft prediction that 
In fact, there should be many more other particles uh, with the same qualitative properties of the, of the QCD axion. So this is the so-called string axivers. Obviously, at this point, we have discovered neither the QCD axion nor any of these axivers axions. So all of these considerations together, to my mind, motivate taking seriously alternative solutions to the strong CP problem. So an alternative class of solutions to the strong CP problem are those based on restoring space-time symmetries. So since a non-zero value of theta bar violates both parity and CP, restoring either of these symmetries can in principle provide a solution to the strong CP problem. So even though theta bar measures the amount of P and CP violation in the QCD sector, um, the origin of the strong CP problem, as we just discussed, uh, really lies in the features of the electroweak sector. The fact that it is the electroweak interactions that maximally violate uh, these two symmetries. So this class of solutions focus on extending the electroweak sector of the standard model in a way such that either parity or CP are now good symmetries of the extended theory. There is another good reason uh, to my mind to consider this class of solutions, which is that in the context of a full UV completion, such as a string theory, um, discrete space-time symmetries like parity and CP can arise as gauge symmetries after a spontaneous symmetry breaking in, in higher dimensions. In that case, uh, being gauge symmetries, they can only be broken spontaneously, not explicitly, and depending on uh, the scale of a spontaneous symmetry breaking, they could solve the strong CP problem in a way that it's more sort of an accident of the features of the, of the UV completion as opposed to being the result of a model building effort that is especially designed to, to arrange for a small theta bar. So let me now tell you about solutions to a strong CP that are based on restoring parity. And as I said earlier, these were first proposed by, by these various authors in these, in these papers. So to restore parity symmetry and solve the strong CP problem, the gauge group of the standard model needs to be extended to include an additional SG2 factor, this SG2 right. And similarly, uh, the matter content needs to be extended to include effectively a mirror copy of both the Higgs and also the fermion sectors of the standard model. The only difference is that um, the SU2 left doublets in the standard model, in the mirror sector, they become doublets of, of SU2 right. So with this extended structure, it is possible to define a generalized version of parity that acts just like ordinary parity, but also exchanges the fields in the standard model and mirror sector. So the um, SU2 left gate sector is exchanged with SU2 right, and similarly for the Higgs, for the Higgs and the fermions. In the model that I'm showing you here, um, the SU3 and U1 factors are not mirror, uh, they are not duplicated, therefore they just transform as usual under parity. So not duplicating the SU3 factor is crucial. Uh, this ensures that theta bar remains odd under this generalized version of parity, which will be key in order to solve the strong CP problem. And in fact, uh, because the QCD vacuum angle is odd under this generalized parity, I am just going to call it parity in the, in the rest of my talk. Duplicating uh, the U1 factor in principle is optional. Um, in principle, it doesn't affect how the model actually solves the strong CP problem, but as we will see in, in a couple of slides, uh, there are some good reasons why, why you'd rather not, not do that. Okay, so with this extended gate sector and matter content, parity can now be a good symmetry. This requires, first of all, that the coefficient of the GG dual operator vanishes, so theta s has to be zero. And also that the Yukawa couplings in the standard model and mirror sectors are the same. So for example, in the up core sectors, uh, we'll have Yukawa interactions for both the standard model and the mirror fields. That the entire Yukawa sector respects parity requires that these two couplings are equal to each other. 
So because of these extended core content uh, of these models, when we compute the contribution to theta bar from the core sector, there is now an extra term that comes from the mirror quarks and it has this form. It is the second term here. So provided the parity is a good symmetry, so provided the Yukawa coupling satisfy uh, this relation, this new term exactly cancels the piece coming from the standard model. So in total, at three level, parity enforces that theta bar completely vanishes in, in these models. And later on, I'll, I'll talk more about what happens with, with radiative corrections once parity is broken. So obviously, parity needs to be broken in these models to make sure that all mirror particles are heavy enough to, to escape, to have escaped experimental detection. So let me discuss first uh, the breaking of parity by, by just adding a soft term in, in the scalar potential. So first of all, generalized parity allows us to write various terms in the scalar potential, ML square piece, um, as well as uh, these two different types of, of quartic couplings. And for now, again, let me just break parity softly by including a mass square term like this. So involving only uh, one of the Higgs doublets. So arranging for different BEVs for the Higgs of the standard model and mirror sectors requires a fine tuning already at three level between the parity preserving and the parity breaking uh, mass terms. And parametrically, the amount of fine tuning is just given by the ratio of the two BEVs uh, squared. So this is an irreducible amount of fine tuning in these models. If we ask that it is better than one part in 10 to the 10, since at the end of the day, um, we're trying to solve the strong CP problem, this sets an upper bound on the scale of parity breaking um, of order 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 GB. So obviously this is a very low bar. Um, we'll see in a minute that we can, do, we can do a lot better than this. Now, this is probably already apparent to some of you, but the structure of this scalar potential and of the entire theory more generally is the same as what we find in, in theories that try to address the electroweak hierarchy problem by realizing the Higgs as a pseudonambu Golston of some accidental global symmetry. And the most famous example of these are so-called uh, twin Higgs theories. So let me make a, a brief parenthetical remark to remind you about this. So the main idea behind the, the twin Higgs mechanism is to realize the Higgs in the standard model as a pseudonambu Goldstone of an approximate SU4 uh, global symmetry. The necessary ingredients uh, of this idea are a so-called twin sector that is a copy of the standard model, both in terms of field content and gauge interactions. The most minimal implementation of this idea that is discussed in, in the second paper, in fact, only requires uh, duplicating the SU2 factor, um, which is the same we have in the, in the parity symmetric models that we are discussing here. And also a global C2 symmetry that exchanges the fields of the, of the standard model and, and mirror sectors. And as a consequence, it imposes that all couplings in the two sectors are equal. And this is also present in, in this class of parity symmetric models, and it precisely corresponds to the internal part of our, of our generalized parity symmetry. So as an accidental consequence of this C2 symmetry, the mass square in the Higgs potential satisfies an accidental SU4 symmetry. This SU4 symmetry is broken spontaneously uh, down to SU3 when the Higgs get BEVs. This leads to seven goldstones, three become the longitudinal modes of the SU2 left gauge bosons, three become the longitudinal modes of the SU2 right guys, and, and the leftover one is identified with the, with the standard model Higgs. And crucially, because of, the, because of the C2 symmetry, radiative corrections to the mass square in the scalar sector remain SU4 symmetric, and therefore do not affect the mass of the, of the pseudonambu goldstone. The BEV of the mirror Higgs, uh, the parity breaking scale, though, uh, that remains quadratically sensitive to, to UV physics, and the theory needs to be UV completed at some scale that is at most a factor of 4 pi above, above V prime. 
So solving the full hierarchy problem requires explaining why V prime is parametrically below the Planck scale, but the weak scale, so the, the Higgs dev in the standard model is already stabilized by, by the twin Higgs mechanism. A hierarchy between V and V prime still requires fine tuning. And this is what I was calling uh, irreducible fine tuning in these models earlier on. But with respect to the Planck scale, there is only one scale that we need to stabilize, not two. So what I want to emphasize is that parity solutions to the strong CP problem do not introduce a second big hierarchy problem because of their accidental um, twin Higgs structure. And in fact, a criticism uh, that was made by, by this author is that uh, naively, this model seemed to require the stabilization of additional scales beyond, beyond the weak scale. But this is in fact not true, okay? Uh, there is a single big hierarchy problem in this series, just like there is in, in the standard model. Okay. So obviously the first question that we want to answer is how low the parity breaking scale can be so as to make that irreducible amount of fine tuning as, as mild as possible. Um, so I said earlier that parity enforces the Yukawa coupling and the, and the gauge couplings in the two sectors to be identical. So naively, this predicts that the spectrum of new particles is just a copy of the standard model, just heavier by a factor of V prime on V. And in this case, uh, the lightest mirror particles will be the partners of the, of the, the up and down quarks. So current LHC bounds already imply tight limits on the mass of, of new color particles on the order of a TeV or so, which would set a lower bound on the parity breaking scale of order 10 to the AGV. And this could put the fine tuning in, in the scalar sector of these models to worse than one part in, in 10 to the 10. And I should say that um, the phenomenology of this particular implementation of these models was looked at by, by Raffaele and Anson in this, in this paper. So it seems like uh, the amount of fine tuning in these models is even worse than the small number that we are trying to, to explain here by solving the strong CP problem. So you're probably thinking, is this the end of my talk? Um, this is not the end of my talk because there is an additional source of Fermi masses than we can write in this series, which is a vector-like mass that involves the SU2 singlets of the standard model and, and mirror sectors. So this new uh, mass term can be consistent with generalized parity, provided that this, this three times three mass matrix is Hermitian. So with this extra term, uh, the full quark mass matrix can be written as a six times six matrix like this. And the contribution to theta bar at three level from, from the core sector can be written as, as the determinant of the full mass matrix in the, in the up and down sectors. So because of uh, this zero in this upper block of the full mass matrix, so it is not possible with the matter content of this series to write a relevant operator with the appropriate quantum numbers to fill this block. So because of this, the expression for theta Q, uh, in fact, does not involve these, this vector-like mass. It is the same as before and Therefore, it remains zero um, at three levels so long as the, the Yukawa coupling satisfy generalized parity. Notice this would uh, also be true even if the, even if the vector-like masses uh, were not Hermitian. So even if parity was softly broken by, by non-Hermitian vector-like masses, uh, we would still have theta bar equals zero at three level. And I'll, I'll talk a lot more about this, about this later. Crucially, uh, these this vector-like mass is only possible in the version of these models that include a single U1 factor. If there were two U1 factors in the standard model and mirror sectors, then this operator would obviously be forbidden by, by gauge invariance. So including this additional mass term, there are now two limiting realizations of the Fermi spectrum in these models. One is the case uh, we already discussed. So if the overall scale of the vector-like masses, what I'm calling capital M here, is much smaller than both B and V prime, then bounds on color particles imply a tight bound on B prime and therefore an unacceptable level of, of fine tuning. 
An alternative possibility is to take the, the scale of the vector-like masses to be much larger than both V and V prime. This leads to an effective season mechanism that can be realized for all the fermions of the standard model, so all quarks and leptons, with the exception, obviously, of, of the top. So in this case, uh, mirror partners of all the light standard model fermions appear at the scale of the, of the vector like masses, well, what I'm going to call uh, the CISO scale. So now uh, new color particles can be made heavy by increasing the CISO scale, not the parity breaking scale. And this is going to help a lot uh, with the fine tuning in these models, as we'll see, as we'll see in a minute. And this is precisely the implementation of these models that we focus on in, in our paper. I should sorry, emphasize, sorry, yeah. Sorry, Isabel, sorry. Why, why accept top? Well, so you want to realize this CISO mechanism uh, while having the fundamental Yukawa couplings remain imperturbative, which is just not possible for the top because, you know, it's just too heavy. Um, so you should think of the you should think of the effective u kappa coupling in these models as you know mod y square v prime on m. Mm -hmm. Obviously, m needs to be um, parametrically above v prime in order to realize the system mechanism, which would mean you know this y square would need to be much bigger than one. Couldn't I get away with square root of four pi's and things like that? You say that doesn't really work. Not really. I mean, you you know, you could do square root of four pi at the CISO breaking scale, but then the Yukapa, you know, the Yukapa couplings will run stronger uh, as you Fair as you plot to the IR. So it's not really uh, feasible for the okay. for the top sector. But you can for the for any other uh, any other sort of fermion with a, with a small Yukapa coupling. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I should emphasize that uh, the CISO scale doesn't have to be the same for all fermions. Uh, it can be different for uh, the different flavors, so long as uh, it is parametrically above the parity breaking scale. But uh, just for simplicity, I am, I am going to assume that it is some common scale um, capital M. Okay, the details of these are not, are not terribly important. There is an upper bound on how large the CISO scale can be that comes from uh, reproducing the mass of the standard model fermions in a way that is consistent with the fundamental Yukawa couplings uh, remain imperturbative. The tightest bound comes from, from the bottom quark and it constrains the CISO scale to be no more than a factor of 100 or so above, above V prime. So, because of this CISO implementation of the masses of uh, the light fermions, the, the right-handed components of the standard model fermions are made of the SU2 right doublets, uh, whereas the much heavier mirror fermions are entirely SU2 singlets. So the easiest oh, sorry. way... Oh. Yes. Sorry, Isabel. Um, but that you presumably you could relax that constraint from the bottom in the same way as... The, I mean, the top would have made a constraint that was even tighter, obviously, and then you say, well, I'm not going to do the top. Could you, couldn't you do the same thing for the bottom if you need, if you wanted to? Um, problem is, you know, if you, if you weren't, um, if you weren't realizing the bottom quark through a CISO mechanism, then you would have a, a mirror B at a scale, which is, you know, 10 to the minus two times V prime, right? You know, bounce on color particles are like one TV. So, you know, this would put V prime already at like a hundred, a hundred TV. Uh, Again, making the fine tuning already sort of a little bit. Uh, the fine tuning can be a lot better. So the scale V prime can be way below 100 TV, as I will discuss in a minute. If if the you know if you also realize the CISO for all light fermions, so it's more like a, the motivation is not so much. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter that you know the CISO scale is 100 times or a thousand times above V prime, but uh, it does matter. You know, our motivation really is you know making V prime as, as low as it can possibly be in order to its fine tuning, and th that helps. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So um, as I was saying, so the easiest way to see this is by if we integrate out at three level the mirror fermions at the CISO scale. This leads to a dimension five higher dimensional operator uh, that looks like this. And when the Higgs of the standard model and, 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 mirror, and, and mirror Higgses get their vacuum expectation values, this leads to a mass for the light fermions that, that looks like this. So crucially, the right-handed component of this Dirac fermion belongs in, in an SU2 right uh, multiplet. 
And again, this is true for the for the downward sector, but also for leptons as well as the first and, and second generation upworks. Again, the one exception, of course, uh, is the top sector. So the top quark, as I said already, is too heavy to implement a, a CISO mechanism. And in this case, uh, both uh, both the top and its mirror partner are made entirely of a standard model and, and mirror fields. So as a consequence of uh, this uh, CISO mechanism, the right-handed components of standard model fermions have unsuppressed couplings to the gauge bosons of the SU2 right sector. Um, they couple to these just like their left-handed currents couple to the standard model uh, W and, and C. As a result of this, uh, the leading constraint on the parity breaking scale in these models actually comes from the direct production of, of W prime and Z prime gauge bosons at the LHC. In particular, uh, the current bound on the W prime mass is on the order of 6 dV, which translates into a parity breaking scale that needs to be um, at least 18 dV. And this brings the fine tuning in these models to around one part in, in 10 to the three. So not fully natural, but certainly um, a lot better than, than 10 to the minus 10. And future colliders such as, for example, uh, the FCC, so a 100 TV uh, proton machine will be sensitive to masses up to around uh, 40 TV. So this corresponds to around 10 to the minus five uh, fine tuning. So effectively, they will be probing most of the parameter space where these models remain an attractive solution to the, to the strong CP problem. And I want to emphasize that this is an irreducible signature of these models. So in this sense, uh, collider experiments are really central to probe this class of solutions to, to the strong CP. Bounds coming from all other particles. Just, yeah. Isabel, can I ask a quick question? There's nothing particular that picks out this mass scale M. So the the, the mass scale M. I, I mean, or let, let me let me rephrase this. There's a term that enters the bottom right hand of that matrix for every different fermion pair. You know, the up, the down, the, uh, the okay. And the you're saying that you need that term for the top to be very small compared right. to that term for the bottom. It is, I guess this is not any tuning problem because these are all technically natural couplings. So yeah. yeah okay. So at the level of the model I'm discussing here where, you know, I'm not UV completing this theory with supersymmetry or anything. Um, you know, this, this vector like masses, I'm just treating them as just some parameters in the Lagrangian that as you say, are technically natural. Um, of course, you know, ideally you would like to have all of these, all of these scales coming from the BEV of some scalar fields, and you know, and realize everything in a way that was natural in itself. Uh, yeah. But that certainly goes beyond what I'm what I'm discussing here. I, I'm I'm just trying to understand. So, like, the upshot here is that we can decrease a tuning problem that looks like ten to the negative ten to a tuning problem that looks like ten to the negative three. But mm -hmm. we also have added in uh, several couplings, and I'm trying to understand. I I guess none of them are technically tuned, right? They're all technically natural, but. The, 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 the parameters that we've added in this model really are only, I would say, those, those vector-like masses and the CISO scale for the various, okay. um, the various flavors. Um, you know, in some UV completion, like if you were, say, super symmetrizing this whole thing, you would like, ideally, that CISO scale to be something like the SUSI breaking scale, uh, mm -hmm. in which case, having all those BEVs that give you those vector-like masses at the SUSI breaking scale would be natural. Uh, with well, the anomaly that, of course, the top, the top work, right. precisely. Uh, you know, the top sector needs to be treated differently than the rest. And, you know, that is, I would say, like a challenge that would need to be addressed in, in any, you know, attractive UV completion, I would say. Okay, thank you. Okay, so... Um, so as I was saying, bounds coming from all other particles that are no W primes or C primes are substantially weaker. So another irreducible feature of these models is the presence of a top partner uh, appearing at B prime, the, the parity breaking scale. But as I said, uh, current bounds on, on additional color particles are, are a lot weaker and are not competitive with, with the bounds uh, from, from W primes or, or C primes. Similarly, these models also have a second Higgs at some scale below the parity breaking scale, depending on the, on the value of this quartic coupling. 
again, bounce on a mirror Higgs like this are, are also very weak and they will only lead to a competitive bound on V prime for, for extremely small values of this, of this quartic coupling. And finally, because of the CISO implementation of all the light standard model fermions, all other mirror quarks and leptons only appear at a much higher scale, the, the CISO scale, which has to be parametrically above V prime. So, so also very hard to, to ever produce directly. Uh, let me now turn to flavor briefly. Uh, these models have new sources of flavor changing neutral currents already at three level mediated by, by the standard model C and, and Higgs boson. So if we integrate out the, the Z, there will be new contributions to the effective Hamiltonian describing, for example, uh, the decay of a, of a strange B meson into two muons. So notice this Wilson coefficient is proportional to G Fermi and this uh, coefficient here corresponds to the strength of this uh, flavor violating vertex. So if this coefficient was order one, um, these models could be very ruled out. However, in these models, the size of, of this coefficient uh, is, is naturally extremely, extremely suppressed. So the exact form of this uh, coefficient is given by, by an expression like this. Uh, it involves the various entries in the Yukawa couplings as well as the mass of the vector-like fermions. Crucially, there is an upper bound on the, on the size of uh, this coefficient from the requirement that the masses of the standard model fermions are correctly reproduced through, the, through that CISO mechanism. So this upper bound looks like this. Um, it is proportional to the masses of those fermions that are involved in the, in the flavor violating interaction suppressed by one power of the parity breaking scale. And uh, which, as I said, uh, has to be at least 18 TeV. And there is an extra suppression factor involving the ratio of the weak scale to the, to the CISO scale as well. So the size of this Wilson coefficient is naturally very, very small in these, in these models. The fractional difference in the, in the branching ratio for this decay compared to the prediction in the standard model is at most of one part in 10 to the three. And that is a lot smaller than even uh, the theoretical uncertainty in, in the standard model prediction, which is of order uh, 10%. So there is a built-in suppression of uh, three-level flavor changing neutral currents in these models that is um, sort of a collateral consequence of, of implementing this, this fermion uh, CISO mechanism. At one loop, things are a little different. So the presence of uh, a mirror W and mirror up quarks lead to additional contributions to the usual standard model box diagram that contributes, for example, to, to chaos mixing. Quantitatively, uh, the leading effect comes from diagrams that involve at least one W, uh, one w and one and one W prime. So the leading contribution to delta MK, for instance, so this is uh, the mass difference between the two mass eigenstates in the, in the K-on sector. Uh, the main contribution to this comes from diagrams where the up and charm quarks propagate inside the loop. And it is roughly of, of this size, which is also substantially smaller than the theoretical uncertainty in the, in the standard model prediction for this, for this quantity. The correction to the epsilon k parameter, which measures CP violation in the k on sector, uh, is basically given by the imaginary part of these diagrams. The correction to epsilon k can be large, but it depends on the, the individual entries of the Yukawa matrices in a way that is not constrained by reproducing the fermion masses. So, not assuming any particular suppression in the off diagonal entries of the Yukawa couplings, um, the measurement of epsilon k can be interpreted as a lower bound on the CISO scale in the up core sector in particular, of order between uh, 750 and 1000 TeV, which is compatible with uh, the upper bound from, from the requirement that the Yukawa couplings stay perturbative. So overall, these theories are certainly consistent with, with current flavor measurements and a more in detail analysis could certainly reveal uh, some constraints on the, on the flavor structure of, of these models of this, of this kind. Okay, let's now move on to discuss uh, what happens to theta bar beyond three levels. So once parity is broken and- well, Sorry, um, Isabel, yes. could you mind going back just one slide? Yes. Sorry. So your implication, though, here is you, you guys have models that are not anarchic Yukawa couplings, 
where this limit on capital M is is much weaker. It's you can get it all the way down to 18 TeV. Yeah, so I mean, if if you are happy to assume some suppression in the orthodiagonal Yukawa couplings, uh, mm -hmm. a suppression of order like 0.1 will be enough to just remove any any significant bounds on the on okay, the scale. Okay. Yeah. So just to ask, so it's not a yeah. Is that just for this epsilon k thing, or is that is there a reason why it holds for all of the different flavor measurements? So no, can, can I mean, the same it's... can the same Yukawa coupling structure deal with all of the different things like this and penguin diagrams and whatever? Um, so basically, it would to the extent that you know these the um, the measurements in the Kon sector are sort of the most constraining because, as I was saying early on, um, you know the couplings between the right-handed standard model fermions and the W primes are not suppressed like like these mm -hmm. other sorry like these other couplings are, uh, and it is the fact that you know this is this this is a correction to the one-loop standard model diagram that. You know, this is the this is the reason why this is the leading the leading constraint. Um, I mean, other other flavor other flavor of observables like for example these, you know, BS to mu plus mu minus. Um, here you don't need any kind of suppression of any kind. Like the the model already is you know these coefficients are very very naturally suppressed. So you know the the constraints from the K on sector are the leading ones, and it would certainly be enough to satisfy any other flavor measurements as well. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks. Does that make sense? Yeah, I just need to think about other loop level flavor stuff, but I guess it's a numbers question. Okay. Good. Um, yeah, so let me turn to uh, what happens to theta bar beyond three levels. So once parity is broken, and I will discuss first what happens again when parity is, is broken softly. So if parity is only broken softly through the mass term in the scalar potential, like I discussed earlier, uh, that amounts to breaking parity without breaking CP. And in that case, uh, the corrections to, to theta bar are no larger than they are in the standard model, okay? There are no new phases. And moreover, um, there are some additional cancellations because parity is restored above, above, the, above the scalar V prime. There is a second source uh, potentially of soft breaking, as I already mentioned earlier, which is through through vector-like masses in the core sector that are non-hermitian, and these could break both parity and CP. So, at three level, as I as I already anticipated uh, in one of my previous slides, because of the structure of the core mass matrix, theta bar remains zero regardless of whether this vector-like mass is, is hermitian or not. So it remains zero. As long as uh, the Yukawa couplings are equal, so as long as the as long as the breaking is is only soft. At one loop, there are corrections to the quark mass matrix that, in general, are complex. Uh, the relevant diagrams are these, so they involve the Higgses and the the C and C primes, uh, as well as uh, the heavy mirror fermions propagating inside the loop. So the contribution to the quark mass matrix from these diagrams, in general, is complex, but when you trace over all the flavors to find out the contribution to theta bar, in fact, uh, the answer is zero. So, so theta bar remains zero also at, at one loop. And this calculation was actually first done by Cladi and Rabindra in this, in this paper. However, I there is- talk, Sorry, Isabel, could yes. you go back to the previous slide? I, I'm just trying to understand what this means. So if parity is only broken softly in the Higgs potential and theta bar is less than 10 to the 19, negative 19. Do you mean that if you break parity but lift the scale arbitrarily high, then you get no new corrections? Because I, I thought the whole point of what we had just been discussing is that in order to remain consistent with other standard model observables, I was stuck in a regime where whatever, I had some tuning of order 10 to negative three at the end of the day, which I would have thought translated into an effective change of theta bar of 10 to negative seven or something like this no okay so first of all when i say if parity is only softly broken in the higgs potential i mean you know if the only source of parity breaking is a mass square term in the higgs potential that breaks mm -hmm. parity uh, that term is forced to be real because the lagrangian has to be real mm -hmm. so there are you know there are that does not introduce new phases in the theory the, all the relative corrections to theta bar are just like in the standard model but additionally with more suppression because you know there are cancellations above the scalby prime where parity parity uh, is restored Mm -hmm. The fine-tuning um, discussion, uh, maybe I should have emphasized earlier on, 
this is not a fine tuning of theta bar. This is a fine tuning of the scalar potential. When I say these models are fine tuned to 10 to minus three, I mean- Ah, so th this is an additional to, like it's a V over V prime type tuning. It's, it is purely a V okay, over V okay, prime tuning. It's a tuning in the scalar potential, which is not the same as the tuning of theta bar. So theta bar is not tuned. I understand, okay. It is the scalar potential that is tuned. I'm still calling that uh, fine tuning because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. you know, we are adding this structure, uh, you know, this, the theory has a certain, um, there are certain terms in the scalar potential we need to break parity. We're doing all of that in order to solve the strong CP problem. So I'm still sort of, you know, even though that's a tuning of the scalar potential, we're yeah, still yeah. trying to solve, you know, it, a 10 to the minus 10 tuning problem. So, but it's a different fine tuning. It's not set up our tuning. Good. Can I ask then a, uh, another question, which is I have this 10 to the negative three tuning in the scalar potential, but also I've raised the scale V prime and does that mean that my overall hierarchy problem is actually better? Like, like is this 10 to negative three tuning worse than the hierarchy problem I had in the standard model? Um, or is the hierarchy problem I had in the standard model now relaxed somewhat? And now I have, you know, I have another scale that I have to establish. I have to establish this 10 to negative three scale as well. But my overall hierarchy between whatever Planck and uh, V prime is not quite as large. I mean, <laughs> You do have a, a tuning in the scalar potential in these models, which is 10 to the minus three. And you still have to explain the hierarchy between V prime and M Planck. Okay. So the hierarchy between V prime and M Planck, yes, because V prime is a bit bigger than the weakest scale. You could say that that tuning is a little bit less severe than the usual hierarchy problem, like in the standard model, not by very much. So mm -hmm. you still have a single um big hierarchy problem like you do in the standard model mm -hmm. and you have a tuning between v and v prime of 10 to minus 3. whether that's better or worse i mean it's a little bit of matter of opinion um you do have a again you you have not double the number of hierarchy problems which is uh you know i think it's one important consideration in these models uh as i was trying to emphasize earlier on there is a still a single hierarchy problem and then yes there is a tuning of 10 to minus 3 between v and v prime but you solve the strong cp problem Hmm. Okay. Yeah, so, thank you. So, sorry, I, I just got confused. Sure, with, sure. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, so I was saying here that uh, potentially you have these uh, one loop contributions that could give you a non zero theta bar, but in fact, the sum of all of these diagrams um, vanishes. However, uh, there is another set of one loop diagrams, which are these same diagrams, but with a photon coming out of this internal Fermi line. And these lead to contributions to the electric dipole moments of, of elementary fermions, both quarks and leptons, that in general are non zero. So, parametrically, these EDMs have this form. So, they are proportional to the charge and mass of the fermion in question, and they are suppressed by, by two powers of the CISO scale, uh, the, mass of the, the mass of the heavy fermions. And obviously they are also proportional to the source of soft breaking. So this factor of delta M on M uh, is just my way of parameterizing how much the vector right masses deviate from, from hermeticity. So let's put in some numbers. Uh, if the deviation from hermeticity is or the one, then the size of the electric dipole moment for the up and down quarks is parametrically of this size. So this is 10 to the minus 28 uh, E times centimeter. And I'm normalizing this to a CISO scale, which is roughly twice the, the parity breaking scale. So this translates into a neutron EDM that is parametrically of the same size. Um, this is two orders of magnitude below the current bound on the neutron EDM, but it could certainly be within reach of near future experiments. Although, of course, uh, this depends strongly on the size of these, of these vector-like masses. Similarly, in the lepton sector, so parametrically, the size of the electron EDM is of this form. And here I am already choosing a value of the CISO scale in the lepton sector that saturates the experimental bound on the electron EDM. So the exact value of these electric dipole moments, again, depends on various details, in particular on the size of the CISO scale in the various fermion sectors. But in general, uh, the predictive neutron and electron EDMs can certainly be, uh, could certainly be within reach of, of future experimental improvements. More realistically, we might expect that the breaking of parity uh, happens spontaneously, not, not just explicitly. And again, this could happen with or without breaking CP. So for example, 
we could break parity without Isabel? breaking. Is, yes. Isabel, so, sorry. Do you mind going 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 back one? So, yes. I mean, could I, um, after it all, it's a, yes. it's a mystery why the lepton Yukawas are so tiny. I mean, could you, could you explain, quote unquote, why the le observed lepton masses are so tiny by taking the seesaw scale of those guys to be large? So even though it seems, you know, by introducing this extra larger scale M in the lepton sector, you may have thought you're introducing some extra tuning. Maybe you're explaining why you have these tiny numbers, which are the tiny lepton Masses. Is that true? Yeah. So obviously, you know, the CISO, the CISO mechanism for any other, it, it just works in the same way that the CISO mechanism for neutrinos works. So the, as I said, like the effective Yukawa coupling for a light mm -hmm. fermion is, you know, mod y square times mm -hmm. v prime on m. Mm -hmm. So if m is parametrically above v prime, which it is in these models, then mm -hmm. the necessary value of the of the the fundamental Yukawa couplings is better by a factor of v prime on m or rather m on v prime uh, and also square root right so yeah the, the yukawa couplings the fundamental yukawa couplings don't have to be anywhere near as small as they but are in instance, standard model. so yeah it, it does help with that with that hierarchy problem in the flavor sector so, it, so if one had for instance some suzy uv completion of all this where you had let's say in the lepton sector an m uh, uh, just in the lepton sector a capital m that was very large a thousand mm -hmm. tv or something you would you would have really gone quite a long way to solving the issue about why the leptons are so light yes i mean this is sort of also a little bit a matter of uh, i don't know taste like uh, yeah of course yeah yeah it's just... you know a hierarchy in the yukawa couplings now is sort of like a hierarchy in the well to some extent it becomes like a hierarchy in some other parameters right it is a milder hierarchy because you know square root is involved and all of this um mm -hmm. but yeah it is it is it certainly could be a, implemented in a, in models like that well, also, you've turned it into a different thing. Rather than a hierarchy in, in dimensionless numbers, you've made it a, a, a yeah. hierarchy in terms of this scale M, especially yeah. in a CZ context, you can imagine trying to do that. Yeah, yeah so there are certainly, you know, in terms of flavor model building, uh, you know, this model sort of, uh, I think, yeah, go, go some yes. way. Yeah, definitely. I haven't thought about that very much, so I, this, I cannot Thank say you. much more. Um, yeah, so I, so I was saying we want to break parity spontaneously, realistically. Uh, you could do that with or without breaking uh, CP. So, for example, you might want to break parity without breaking CP uh, in a model with two with two real scalar fields. What I'm calling here sigma and sigma prime. If this quartic coupling is negative, then the vacuum of this sector happens when when one of the fields gets a BEV and the other is zero. And then coupling the sigma sector to the Higgs sector, uh, then we can translate the spontaneous parity breaking uh, to the Higgs sector, and it will allow us to realize uh, different BEVs for the for the standard model and, and mirror Higgses. I am not suggesting that this is the most beautiful implementation of a spontaneous parity breaking in these models. I just wanted to emphasize that, at least in principle, it is possible to break parity without breaking CP. And in that case, uh, the value of theta bar will again remain at least as small as in the standard model. More generally, breaking parity will also involve breaking CP. And this will be the case, for example, if parity is broken through the web of a pseudoscalar, uh, which can then be translated to the Higgs sector through the, through the, appropriate, through the appropriate coupling. However, uh, if this is the case, it is then also possible to write down a new class of Yukawa couplings involving the pseudo-scalar and the, um, the SG2 single fermions. And again, such a term will be consistent with generalized parity, so long as these new Yukawa couplings are Hermitian. With these couplings, there are now a new class of one-loop diagrams that contribute to the quark mass matrix. So these are the same type of diagrams we had before, except that now the Higgses can mix with the, with the pseudoscalar. This leads to a contribution uh, to theta bar at one loop, uh, which is of this form. And in order for this to be smaller than 10 to the minus 10, this coupling has to be very small, smaller than, than around 10 to the minus 6. In fact, uh, this was actually pointed out first by these by these guys in this in this paper. So, if the parity uh, the breaking of parity also involves breaking CP, as in this example, then the symmetry breaking sector uh, cannot really interact with the with the quarks. This is not the most attractive feature of these models, uh, but at least having these having these Yukawa couplings, these new Yukawa couplings being tiny, is actually is technically natural. So they won't be radiatively generated if they are not there at tree level. 
Now, uh, one of the motivation to consider uh, solutions to the strong CP problem that are different from the QCD axiom was that the U1 peak is symmetry had to remain a very high quality global symmetry in any UV completion. By contrast, parity can easily be broken without spoiling the solution to the strong CP problem. So if parity is a global symmetry, the leading higher dimensional operator that breaks parity explicitly and leads to a direct contribution to, to theta bar uh, looks like this. So these operators are dimension five. They are suppressed by a single power of M Planck. If these coefficients, so these matrices that I'm calling here alpha are non-Hermitian, then these operators break generalized parity. If this is the case, uh, then when the Higgses in both sectors get their BEVs, these operators lead to a contribution to the quark math matrix that in general will be complex and therefore will contribute to theta bar. And in particular, uh, the leading contribution quantitatively comes from the correction to the, to the masses of the up and down quarks. So overall, uh, the contribution to theta bar is of this form where mod alpha here uh, means the typical size of the coefficients of these higher dimensional operators. If these coefficients is, uh, are all the one, uh, then not spoiling the solution to the strong CP problem sets an upper bound on the parity break in a scale of around 20 TeV, which is compatible with the lower bound from the, from the direct production of W prime and C prime gauge bosons at the LHC was, uh, if you remember, was around, around 18 TeV. So even an order one breaking of parity by, by gravitational effects won't spoil the solutions to the strong CP problem. However, obviously, uh, these two numbers are, are very close to each other, which means that if gravity maximally violates global symmetries, then the prediction for, for the neutron EDM uh, would certainly be large enough to be observed in, in upcoming experiments. What happens if parity was a gauge symmetry instead? In that case, parity cannot be broken explicitly, only spontaneously. Um, the higher dimensional operators we were just considering can still be there. Uh, they can still be generated, but their coefficients uh, would need to be Hermitian so as to respect generalized parity. And in that case, they would just not contribute to, to theta bar. But we still need to consider higher dimensional operators that would break parity proportional to the source of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking. So for example, uh, again, if we're breaking parity with a pseudo scalar, then there are two types of higher dimensional operators. One is the obvious uh, phi GG dual term. And a second one is just uh, the standard Yukawa couplings, but multiply by one power of the pseudo scalar. And Again, uh, here, when, when all the scalars get BEVs, these lead to a contribution to the quark mass matrix that in general will be complex, okay? So demanding that uh, the contribution from these operators to theta bar is smaller than 10 to the minus 10 implies an upper bound on the parity breaking scale. Um, the strongest bound actually comes from, from the second operator and it is of order 10 to the seven GB, which is, a much weaker bound than, than we found before uh, if, if parity was, was a global symmetry. So overall, uh, this class of solutions to, to the strong CP problem are very robust against, against the breaking of parity by, by higher dimensional operators. So there is one last uh, topic that I want to discuss uh, related to gravitational wave signatures. Is it okay if I just go on for another five minutes or so? Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, so let me again uh, turn to the last topic that I want to uh, discuss. So regardless of the details of how parity is spontaneously broken, a feature of any theory that contains a spontaneously broken uh, discrete, discrete symmetries is the presence of um, domain wall solutions. Uh, these are topological defects. Uh, they are characterized by their surface tension, which is set by the scale of a spontaneous symmetry breaking. and if the discrete symmetry is global, then as you know, these objects are, are topologically stable. Now, the existence of domain walls has traditionally been considered a, a fatal problem in theories with spontaneously broken discrete symmetries. And that's because this class of topological defects can be formed in the early universe after reheating takes place. 
if that happens, because the energy density in domain walls redshifts more slowly than matter or radiation, then domain walls will end up dominating the, the universe's energy density. And this leads to a subsequent evolution that is inconsistent with, with observation. So this is typically known as the domain wall problem. However, this is no longer a problem if we remember that we expect quantum gravity to violate all global symmetries. So the breaking of parity uh, due to gravitational effects will break the degeneracy between uh, the two vacua related by the discrete symmetry. So for example, uh, this is the leading higher dimensional operator that breaks parity in the pseudo-scalar sector. And I am writing here uh, an overall coefficient, epsilon, that I'm using to parameterize how much gravity violates this, this global symmetry. So after a spontaneous symmetry breaking, this operator will need to uh, an energy difference between these two uh, previously, previously degenerate back one, which is given by, by this expression. So crucially, once the two vacua are no longer degenerate, any domain wall network that may have formed in the early universe becomes unstable. And instead, the universe will evolve into the vacuum that has uh, the, smaller, the smallest energy density. When this happens, uh, the collapse of the domain wall network results in the emission of a significant amount of gravitational radiation that today uh, we may be able to detect as a stochastic background of gravitational waves. So the evolution of the domain wall network and in particular the time it takes for the network to collapse is determined by the competition of these two effects. So on the one hand, the fact that the two vacua at either side of the wall are, are no longer degenerate means there is a force per unit area acting, acting on the wall due to this pressure difference. Uh, so this obviously has a destabilizing effect on the network. And on the other hand, uh, the surface tension of the domain walls leads to, again, uh, a force per, per unit area that, has, that is given by this expression, where R here is the typical radius of a, of a domain wall. So typically, the curvature radius of a domain wall will be set by the Hubble scale at the time, which during a radiation dominated universe is just proportional to, to time. So as time goes forward, uh, the effect of this pressure difference becomes more relatively more important and the whole network uh, collapses when these two quantities become, become comparable. And this happens at a time given by, by the ratio of the domain wall tension over the difference in energy densities, which in turn, it is uh, inversely proportional to the breaking, to the breaking of parity. So obviously the smaller epsilon, uh, the smaller the breaking of parity by gravitational effects, the later the domain walls will disappear. So there is a lower bound on how much parity has to be broken in order to make sure that um, this time is, is fast enough to make sure that domain walls do not come to dominate the energy density. And this is what I'm showing here in this plot. So this y-axis corresponds to the coefficient of our parity violating higher dimensional operator. This x-axis corresponds to the VEV of, of the pseudo-scalar, which I just suggesting as, as V prime, okay, the scale of, of parity breaking. So values of the parity breaking scale below 18 TV are ruled out by collider bounds, as, as we discussed earlier. On the other hand, uh, values of the parity breaking scale that are to the right of this dashed line, um, so larger than a few times 10 to the 4 TV. Here, the fine tuning becomes worse than one part in 10 to the 10. So ideally, you want to live as close to this, to this green area as possible. And as I already said, the leading bound on the size of epsilon comes from making sure that the domain walls disappear uh, fast enough and that, and that rules out this, this entire blue region here, okay? So in the region of low tuning, uh, this coefficient needs to be at least larger than, than 10 to the minus 13 or so. There are two quantities that characterize the, the stochastic background of gravitational waves that results from the collapse of the domain walls, uh, which are the peak frequency of the background, as well as the strength of the signal at that uh, frequency peak. So the peak frequency is basically just set by um, the typical radius of the domain walls at the time of collapse. Uh, parametrically, again, this is just given by the corresponding Hubble scale, which during radiation domination uh, just goes like time. On the other hand, uh, the amount of energy density that goes into gravitational radiation is 
essentially just determined by the domain wall tension. So there is the mandatory power of G Newton and then uh, the two powers of, of, the, of the domain wall tension in order to make out for, for dimensions. So the smaller epsilon, the later, um, the smaller the breaking of parity due to higher dimensional operators, the later the collapse happens and therefore the lower the frequency of the signal will be, but also because there is less shift between the time of collapse and today, uh, the stronger the stronger the signal. Uh, so this is um, what I'm showing here. So x-axis, this corresponds to the peak frequency of the gravitational wave signal. Uh, Y-axis is the energy density uh, normalized to, to critical energy density as usual uh, at this, this frequency peak. So this blue region corresponds to uh, the region where, where the peak of the stochastic background could fall. Uh, this dashed line again, uh, corresponds to the parity breaking scale of 18 TV, which is the minimum compatible with, with collider bounds. Uh, and this other dashed line, again, is the value of V prime for which the tuning becomes already of order one to the 10. So again, for low tuning, you want to leave as close to this uh, left uh, dashed line as, as possible. These dotted lines correspond to uh, fixed values of epsilon. So again, the coefficient of our higher dimensional operator. So here going from 10 to minus 12, 10 to minus 10 and so on. So there is some region of parameter space, especially uh, here at, in the region of low tuning where the signal from this stochastic background could be within reach of current and future gravitational wave detectors, uh, especially those operating in the, in the very low frequency range. So from 10 to the minus nine to 10 to the minus six Hertz. So this is my last slide uh, before the conclusions. Uh, obviously for um, a full solution to, to the strong CP problem must also solve the electroweak hierarchy problem without spoiling uh, theta bar. This is true for this class of models, but also really for any other solution to the strong CP problem, including, including the QCD axiom. It is true though, and this is one of the criticisms uh, that was raised in this paper that if one tries to supersymmetrize uh, the models that I've discussed here, then this can typically spoil the solution to, to a strong CP. Uh, this is a perfectly fair criticism. Um, again, that again was first raised I think by, by these people. Uh, I wish I had something really smart to say about this. I don't and I think building a UV completion to these models that stabilizes the parity breaking scale without the spoiling theta bar is one of the most uh, important open questions I would say for this model. So let me just conclude. Um, theories that restore parity symmetry can provide an attractive solution to the strong CP problem, I think. And unlike other solutions like the QCD axiom, they are robust against the breaking of global symmetries especially as expected in the context of, of a gravitational UV completion. This class of solutions has experimental implications for uh, a wide range of experiments, crucially colliders, but also others like EDM experiments or, or gravitational waves. Um, and compared to other solutions uh, to the strong CP problem, uh, like the QCD axion, I would say that these theories have been uh, relatively underexplored. And there are still many open questions, especially the question of UV completion, as I, as I said, but I think it is also, uh, they are also a timely opportunity given the progress that we're going to see in all of these, in all of these experiments in the, in the near future. So thank you. I'm sorry for going so much over time. Okay, well, thanks very much. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Um, let's think. We had quite a few throughout the talk. Um, oh, sorry. Or you can go ahead. Uh, oh, Peter, go I, for it. I was just going to say, what um, do you, so you, you had the, the prediction, at least depending on where you are in parameter space, um, that you could see potentially EDMs soon within the next, you know, now or within the next one or two orders of magnitude for the electron and the, and the nucleon. Do you have a, it was harder for me to follow the whole parameter space and everything. Right. Is there like a, a lower bound that, I mean, I know there's never, you know, there's probably never really a, a real lower bound, but in other words, something that you would predict now that you'd say, look, if I, let's say, for example, if I don't see EDMs by this level, 
I'll think I've covered, you know, 90% of the parameter space for this model or something like that. So it's very hard to say that, um, you know, one disadvantage, I mean, it's, it is what it is, but I would say one, uh, you know, maybe disadvantage of these models is that, you know, there isn't like a smoking gun signature like that, that you can say, I can always decouple, you know, the smallest the theta bar can be in this model really is 10 to the minus 19. Like if I take the CISO scale large or, you know, I can turn these things off uh, in various ways. So um, as respect to the, both the neutron EDM and the electron EDM, these are more like soft predictions, I would say. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean that, yeah, as you say, it is what it is. That happens a lot. Um, what, I guess, I guess what I missed though is, did that not introduce any extra, um, degree of tuning anywhere or anything else i mean it's hard for me to follow every parameter um yeah uh, uh like let me see. in other words would you really say that's an order one chunk of your parameter space that that has you know the same amount of tuning for the vevs and things like that is that you know, what say? it is hard to tell in the without the uv completion for example like the we, we present the calculation in our paper, right? Okay, with all the ice dotted and this cross, but effectively the, the, the result for these EDMs for the elementary fermions is like this. And again, this M is the CISO scale. And this factor here is how much uh, parity breaking there is in those vector-like masses by there being on Hermitian. So without having some kind of prior from like, how am I realizing those vector-like masses in a UV completion? You know, I really don't know what this is, right? Uh, if if that model has additional phases coming in on, on the web, so those scalar fields, this could easily be order one. And this is what I was taking to make these estimates. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Could this be very tiny? Could these vector-like masses be almost Hermitian? Again, I think without UV completion, it's very hard to tell. So that's kind of the problem. Yeah, fair enough, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that is what it is, right? Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Yeah, just uh, a, a question. Uh, thank you for the talk, by the way. It was it was great, and uh, it uh, sort of. It's, I'm impressed. Uh, I'm impressed that after I had two slides on Twin Hicks, you were still in the talk. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> this is an achievement. It's an achievement. No, no. Well, one gets soft in all days. <laughs> Maybe you no, become more open-minded. <laughs> Maybe, you know what Woody Allen said, yeah. Uh, so, uh, no, I, I just was uh, wondering, uh, as John was alluding to before, uh, how much have people studied CISO approaches to flavor problems? By flavor problems, I mean really old fashioned, uh, like John. Uh, you know, say, you <laughs> yeah. know, how do you explain yes. fermion masses? Yeah, so actually, um, <laughs> we were a bit surprised. I mean, this, you know, obviously, you know, the CISO mechanism uh, is sort of like an old, you know, it's an old sort of uh, idea. And, you know, this, now we talk a lot about the CISO mechanism for neutrinos, but actually, uh, it was around this time, uh, a little bit before these guys had their paper, that people were actually building, uh, you know, the CISO, the CISO models for all of the, all of the fermions. Um, and in fact, you know, the solutions to the strong CP problem were more sort of proposed that way. Like people started writing down parity symmetric models uh, that mm -hmm. realized, you know, where they could implement the CISO mechanism in order to explain why the Yukawa couplings were so tiny. And then these guys realized that, you know, those models sort of like accidentally had very small theta bar. Um, Mm -hmm. But I would say that, you know, there was that early work uh, and we cite all those season models in, in our paper. Um, but mostly since then, I think it's been kind of a little, it's been largely, uh, I would say, kind of um, ignored. Uh, so people haven't thought about, people haven't focused on those, you know, that, that line of sort of flavor model building for the other mm -hmm. fermions. Um, I mean, part of it is also perhaps, you know, there are also parity symmetric implementations like, you know, parity versions of the standard model where you don't duplicate the matter contents. You just, you know, you duplicate the SU2 factor and then put all the singlets into SU2 write doublets. Those don't allow you to realize the CISO mechanism. So, it, it, I mean, it is more motivated, I would say, in the context of, you know, these models where you try to solve a strong CP, but I think it's interesting. And, you know, again, like you translate the flavor problem to a different problem, which are the scales of the CISO masses, but perhaps right. 
perhaps in a UV completion that's you know a little bit easier to. No, but as John was saying, maybe the, it's easier to, to explain hierarchies of dimensionful parameters than dimensionless parameters. And so, yeah. Yeah. No, the, I, I mean, the main line is, you know, uh, in a possible unfair criticism of, of, of this approach is that it introduces a lot more structure than, than the, you know, PQ solution. And the one doesn't know how to, you know, what grade, you know, to, to give to, to this additional ingredient. But if you accomplish more, if you solve more problems, like you shed light on flavor problems, then, then it may be worthwhile to have this new structure. I think you do. And, I mean, also, um, and I think this was in one of my previous slides, which is, uh, you know, there are people like Michael Dine that have been advocating for quite a while that, you know, space-time symmetries, discrete the space-time symmetries like parity and CP, you know, often arise as gauge symmetries. Uh, in that case, then they really need to be spontaneously broken. You cannot break them explicitly. And in that case, this kind of structure is kind of forced on you. Um, so that's also, I think, a motivation to consider, um, you know, models where P or CP are broken spontaneously. Uh, because again, it could just be a feature of the UV completion and then for free, that could potentially explain a small, a small thing about it. So maybe that's, you know, that's a little bit of like top-down motivation as well. Also, also, isn't it true these models are vastly simpler than Nelson Barr? I remember looking at Nelson Barr many years ago and-, and Yeah, Nelson Barr the, models the have their own- bag. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the problem with Nelson Barr is of course, uh, there all the problem comes from the fact that you are trying to keep theta about zero where at the same time, you know, um, having like another one CKM. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're asking for, that's where the main, the main difficulty comes from. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and they are, I mean, they are surprisingly a lot, lot better than this, you know, the Sambar, the Sambar models for sure. Mm. Can, I, can I ask a question about actually, uh, I'm going to go again, very old school here. So at the, at the prime, at the scale of V prime, Generalized parity forces the SU2 left and SU2 right gauge couplings to be equal. Yes. So, so now if I try to do unification of those things and they run up, I mean, now, now I have four couplings, right? This is a rank five group, right? I mean, so it's SU3 cross SU2 cross SU2 cross U1. So it's rank five again. And this must, Savas, you must remember, this fits, this fits, it fits in SO10. And this fits and into like some, this. yeah. Yeah, this, 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 is, this yeah. is like Jagesh. Jagesh yeah. would love this, right? So this yes. fits in SO10. But now you have an extra constraint, right? This, you really, but you, you, you do need to have the V prime scale not very high. Like you could, you, I mean, if you had the V prime scale to be, I don't know, like the Gata scale. No, but I was wondering whether actually what, what happens to the, the evolution of the couplings before you worry about UV completing. Just ignore that issue for a second. I wonder if you actually just have you have you guys run the R, the RGs no. you get and see what you get because you have this boundary condition. You know the values of all the couplings here. You know the SE two right coupling as well. Maybe something miraculous happens. Like what miraculous meaning what? And we do have the scale separation between the seesaw scale and the V prime scale. So there's the uncertainty there as well. You can move that around right. and get it to do what true, you want. True, true. Well, maybe that fit. Maybe that fixes <laughs> yeah, the exactly. seesaw scale for you. Okay, guess you do that. I mean, again, we're sort of mostly motivated by having the V prime scale low, in which case, you know. No, but, I, but I think what Robert said is, is, is right. Right, you could you could fix V prime at your lowest possible level, eighteen TV, and then then allow M to vary and see what happens with gauge gap. Maybe something. It does seem like this gets an interesting possibilities as far as flavor. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't thought about this at all. So. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. okay. Cool. Well, um, actually, let me just uh, stop.